많지. major to stop sharing.
Okay, everybody. Hi, and um, welcome to this live class. I hope that you can all hear me. Uh, if you cannot hear me, please, well, you're not going to be able to hear what I'm telling you to do. But in um, any case, um, I hope that this works well. Just expect maybe we'll have one or two technical glitches. I currently have you all muted. Um, so if you want to ask a question, you can unmute yourself. Ask the question, I'll mute you uh, again afterwards. Um, but I've also enabled chatting. So you can actually write a question if, if you want to do so. Um, as I told you before, the class is actually recorded. And so um, it will be posted for you to review again. And um, I hope that this works well. Uh, Wednesdays, we will have a recorded Zoom class as we have before. But don't forget that on Thursdays at 12 o'clock, I'll have a one half hour um, question time where anybody that wants to ask questions, you can come on. I will send you the, I will send you the, the link for that. Okay. So I believe that there's also a way for you to wave at me if you want to ask a question. If you wave at me and I, I'll unmute you and you can ask a question. I'm not quite sure how that works. I don't have a wave function. He, apparently you do. Okay, so today, what have we been doing so far? We've been talking, we talked first of all about atoms and molecules, and we looked to see how we took atoms and molecules and how we put them together to form these large biological molecules that we talked about. We talked about our four classes of biological molecules, and we now need to start taking those molecules and actually putting them together into the functional unit of life. And the functional unit of life is the cell. And the, the cell is regarded by biologists as being the symbol of life in a way, because it's the smallest unit that can perform all of the functions of life. It does, a single cell does everything that we regard as being characteristic of life. And uh, first of all, let's remember, there are many, many, many very, very successful organisms which only have one cell. And uh, it's tempting to look at the cell and think that this is simple, but it's not. This cell, single-celled organism, is doing everything that every other organism does. And it's organized the same way that every other organism is organized. So let's re remember our basic, uh, just let me try to get this, oh, sorry. Um, I just want my little spotlight thing. There we go. Um, so let's remember that every cell is defined by a, this plasma membrane right around the outside, which we call the cell membrane. The outermost plasma membrane is co often called the cell membrane. And that is actually what defines the cell. It, not, it provides a boundary to the cell and it allows conditions on the inside of the cell in this part of the cell called the cytoplasm or the cytosol. Mm -hmm. it, conditions in here can be different conditions on the outside because the cell membrane, thin as it is, you remember we, we saw it was a thin double layer of phospholipid and thin as it is, it can control what goes in and what goes out in, in both directions. That allows it to keep conditions here on the inside of the cell different to those on the outside. We're going to discover, of course, that there are two kinds of cell we recognize. There are two basic forms of the cell. This one here is a eukaryote cell. That is, it has not only the cell membrane, it has other membranes inside the cytoplasm. It has other membranes. You can see that they are forming distinct units around that with their own membrane around them. The one that's easiest to see in actual fact is the largest of all, and that's this one here, which is the nucleus. And the nucleus contains most, not all, but most of the DNA of the cell and it contains the DNA in the form of chromosomes. It has its own membrane system. So do all of these other 
organelles that you can see inside. So it's possible for a cell to not only have one membrane, but have many. And these membranes are doing exactly the same thing. They are allowing conditions inside the organelle to be different to the conditions on the outside. The outside now being the cytoplasm. Now the inside of the organelle is different to the outside. Sometimes it's radically different. For instance, we're going to encounter one organelle where the pH is extremely low, where the pH on the outside is practically neutral. Um, some organelles have the inside very, very acid for various reasons. Okay, so function of membranes is always to provide a boundary, a controllable boundary. When we look at the single cell like this, it does everything. It does everything that we do. First of all, it moves. If you look carefully on the outside, you'll see it's got little hairs called cilia, which move it. Um, the second thing is it reproduces. These can reproduce in one of two ways. They can either just divide, they grow and divide into two identical daughter cells. But th they can also reproduce by mating. So they, uh, they move, they mate, they feed, they excrete. They do, all, they do every single thing that an advanced organism, a multicellular organism does, but they do it all within the span of this one cell. So even though we look at them, we think, oh yeah, well, this is a single cell. It's by no means a simple, a simple thing. It encompasses all of the processes that characterize a whole, any other organism, unicellular or multicellular. And so, <clears throat> um, first of all, the basic things that we need to know about cells. First of all, they always have plasma, they always have a, at least one plasma membrane. And sometimes it's- Hi, excuse me. Yes. Um, and you're uh, just question. You're you're still gonna post the videos of you doing this, right? Of talking like this, right? I beg your pardon. You know how you usually post the videos on YouTube? Like, are you still gonna post yes. the ones? Yes. Okay, good. Cause like you're moving kind of fast for me, and I'll just, I just. All right. Am I going too? If I'm going too fast, I'll try slow down. That's that's fine. Yeah, I'll try to slow down, but it is a, it will be available. I'm sorry, you know, it's very difficult for me to judge because I don't have any, I can't see you. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, it's okay, I understand. Yeah, okay, so I'll try to slow down. If I speed up again, just just tell me again. All right, I'm going to mute you. Is that, does that satisfy your, your question? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm just going to mute you again, okay. Um, so, all right, so let's just step back. Let's have a look at the basic structure of any cell. Well, the first thing we saw, we've already seen on our little one cell organism, is that they have plasma membranes. Sometimes they only have one plasma membrane. The cell that we just looked at, the, in the, this, little, this little ciliate here, there are many membranes. There's a cell membrane on the outside, but there are many membranes on the inside as well. We're going to see that bacteria, for example, only have one membrane, but there's still a cell because it's the cell membrane that defines the, what is a cell. On the inside of the cell, there is a fluid. It's a, it's a fluid which is a solution of so many substances, especially large biological molecules that it's almost like a gel. It's like a jello kind of consistency. We call it the cytosol. But when we look at the whole thing, we often refer to it as the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is formed from the cytosol, which is the solution itself. Inside every cell somewhere, there is hereditary material. The hereditary material is always DNA. That is characteristic of life on our planet. Every living thing has DNA. And the bulk of the DNA is usually carried on, a, in, on one or more chromosomes, which are molecules of DNA, individual molecules of DNA. And the, those chromosomes carry the genes. The genes are the units of heredity. The genes have recipes on them. 
they contain recipes for the proteins which the cell is going to need. We've already discussed proteins and you'll remember how incredibly diverse they were. They did all sorts of things inside the cell. So the chromosomes have to carry a huge amount of information. Every gene codes for one polypeptide, one string of amino acids will, which will go to form a protein. So there we've got to have a lot of genes we're going to have a lot of hereditary material. And most of it is carried on, on one or more big chromosomes. Now, the, those, the genes cannot communicate directly with the cell. The, we can't read off protein directly from DNA. Instead, we require an intermediate. And that intermediate is called RNA. It's another nucleic acid. Think back to our last classes. When we talked about nucleic acids, we saw that DNA is a double molecule. RNA is a single molecule. So what happens is the DNA has to be, a copy has to be made in RNA. And the cell can read RNA quite successfully. So we have DNA, we make an RNA copy, we send that out to the cytoplasm. And in the cytoplasm, these little bodies, the ribosomes, read the messenger RNA and they will produce the appropriate um, protein polypeptide from what they read. So this is, I think, the first time, and maybe the second time that I've introduced this to you. And this is a very important concept in biology. And it's called the central dogma. And it states that DNA is transcribed. That is the process of copying DNA to RNA. DNA is transcribed to messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA is translated by ribosomes. That is the process of reading the recipe on the RNA and producing a polypeptide from it. And that is done by the ribosomes. That is the central dogma. Get it in your head. You must remember this, okay? You must, must, must remember this. The central dogma is DNA is transcribed to messenger RNA, which is translated to protein by the ribosomes. Why is it called the central dogma? The central dogma because it applies to every single living thing. It applies to bacteria, to those little single-celled organisms that we just saw, on all the way up to us. All living things use this process. And that's why it's called the central dogma. And it's a reflection of the fact that this process um, evolved in a cell, in the original cell. And we have all inherited it from that ultimate ancestor of ours. It works so well, it's been kept all the way through evolution, through all billions of years, it's been kept as the central method for running the cell. It is this characteristic of living things that they all obey the central dogma. Okay, so we've got two real broad categories of um, cell that we're going to look at. The first are relatively simpler cells. And these cells only have a cell membrane around the outside. They don't have internal membranes. They only have a cell membrane. And the very first thing you notice when you look at them is that there is no nucleus because the, the nucleus is a membrane bound organelle in more highly evolved cells. In these cells, there is no nucleus. Instead, here is the DNA. It's inside the cytoplasm. Now you'll often see them describe this. They'll say the DNA is loose inside the cytoplasm. Well, I don't like using that term because it implies some sort of disorganization. If you say it's loose, it sounds like it just... It's just Wait, why is, it, why is it loose in the cytoplasm? Like what happened? It has no membrane around it. It has no membrane to form a boundary around it. That's why. 
So th they will say, okay, it's loose in the site, but, but I don't like that term because it's actually very carefully organized inside the cytoplasm. It just doesn't have a membrane around it. Okay, so um, there it is there. In these organisms, it's called a nucleoid. You'll see the word there. A nucleoid because it doesn't have a membrane. There are no other membranes. But when we look at the cell, we realize it has everything that every other cell does have. It has the cell membrane. It has the cytoplasm. It has ribosomes. And it, has, it obeys the central dogma. Here's the DNA. It transcribes DNA to RNA. And the RNA is translated by the ribosomes. So it's doing everything that every other cell does. It's just relatively simpler. These kinds of cells, with only the cell membrane around the outer, we call prokaryotes. These are the prokaryotes. And the group that you will have heard of, I'm sure, are the bacteria. So the bacteria are prokaryotes. They do not have a nucleus. They do not have membrane-bound organelles. And um, they, nonetheless, I must, I must tell you, they still, we would think that their organization is simpler, but they aren't in themselves that simple because all of the metabolic processes, all the metabolic processes that drive us and drive any higher organism, all evolved in the bacteria. They have similar processes to us. Their cellular mechanisms are very, very similar. And remember, the hereditary material is DNA just as it is for us. Um, there, I'm not going to go through all of the, the features of the cell here. Um, you'll see that there's stuff on the outside. They don't only have a cell membrane, they also have a, a cell wall around them and various other things. But for the moment, let's just concentrate on the fact that this is a prokaryote, simpler prokaryote cell. The other thing is they're usually much, much smaller than the other cells we're going to encounter now. Excuse me, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, what's the difference between a cell membrane and a cell wall? Oh, okay, that's a good question. Uh, we will get to it in more detail. But um, yes, the cell membrane is the phospholipid membrane around the outside. The cell wall is a, is a thick, non-living structure that lies outside the cell membrane. And I'll explain its, its function in a while. For the moment, you can think um, in this uh, cell here, you see the, the, this reddish color there is the cell membrane. This yellowish shell on the outside is the cell wall. So the, the, the cell membrane is a living structure. The cell wall is not a living structure. It's made of substance, very, usually very strong substances, which afford protection to the cell. But we need to explain what kind of protection and that I'll do in a minute. Okay, so they're quite different to one another. Um, okay, uh, the one thing I must just say, um, try to explain to you, um, the cell membrane, the plasma membrane around the outside, which forms the cell membrane, um, is important because it's selective and it allows the passage of certain molecules and not others. And so it regulates the passage of molecules back and forth across it. So it's really an essential part of the cell. Everything that the cell needs has got to pass across that cell membrane. And everything that really the cell doesn't need, like waste matter and everything, has got to be pushed out away from, away from the cell. Now that puts a constraint on the size of the cell, which is a little bit difficult to conceive of. But you can think of it this way. If, I, if you look at a, a, any, like a sphere or a square or whatever it has on the outside it has a certain area the surface area and if i look at the ratio of the outside surface area to the volume the smaller the body the greater the relative size of the outside surface area i know it sounds contradictory but if what we're talking about is a ratio of surface area to volume the smaller we go, the greater that ratio of surface area to volume becomes. If, we, if our cell gets too big, 
there's not enough surface area to service the whole volume. And that puts a constraint on the size of cells. That is why we don't get huge cells, like elephants rolling around, because their cell membrane could not service that huge volume. Instead, they have to be at the right size where they have the appropriate surface area for the volume of the cell. And that, that constrains the size of the cell. Okay, so here is, uh, let's just remind ourselves, here is the, the plasma membrane. Let's just think that this is the plasma membrane around the outside, and uh, because that will suit both our prokaryote cell and the cells we're gonna talk about in a minute. So this here is an electron micrograph. It's a, of, of across the cell membrane. And you can see the dark gray there. Those are the phospholipid heads. Remember, the phospholipid heads are hydrophilic. They dissolve in water very easily. And so here they are dissolved in the water outside and dissolved in the water inside the cytoplasm. In between them are the hydrophobic tails there. So the heads are dissolved in water. The tails are not dissolved in water. They're hydrophobic. They're desperately trying to get away from water, so they exclude all the water. This means that this makes this a very, very profound barrier. It's very difficult for many substances to get across. There are certain things which can. Surprisingly enough, some water can get across. Um, and gases can get across. But things like ions and anything charged, polar molecules, this sort of thing, they find it very, very difficult to make their way past the hydrophilic and then the hydrophobic. Hello, who did that? What's that? Whoever did that? I'm could sorry, I didn't, I didn't yeah. even know you could see that. I'm sorry. Yes, please take it off. Can you take okay. it off? How okay. did you do that? It's all right, let's see, maybe it just goes away. All right, that's fine, thank you. Um, okay, where was I? No, that's fine, no worries, <laughs> no worries. Who's got a question? Somebody's got a question. Uh, sir, I'm sorry to interrupt. After you're done explaining this, do you mind going back to the previous slide? I had a question about something. Sure, sure, okay. Let, let me just finish this, and then I, uh, we're not gonna do this in much more detail, so, and then I'll go back. Okay, so that's our, that's our phospholipid membrane. It's a very good barrier, and but stuff's still got to get across, right? So embedded into the membrane, there are many, many proteins which are going. To, that, that is what governs what moves back and forth across. The proteins choose what gets across. They do it in various ways, but they are the they are the gateways to the inside and the outside of the cell across this. this membrane barrier. Okay, let's go back and you can give me give me your question. Uh, yeah, which one? This? No, the the one that you had before. Before this? Mm. No, like, At actually, no, it, it's the one where we were discussing the plasma membrane. Uh, yeah, that, that is this one. It was like the, the, it's okay, whatever. I'll just ask my question. Uh, does huh? anything, does, do liquids go through the plasma membrane? Like, can they like diffuse in and out or no? Depends what they are. It depends what, no. Um, uh, uh, in general, in general, there's very few things get across. And um, uh, in general, it would be things like gases would go across quite easily. Water molecules can make their way across. They don't do it very efficiently, but they can. But most other things are excluded. So from, like, and, but, and don't forget that this is suspended in water, okay? In an aqueous solution, at least. So what I was like referring to was like nutrients. Like, you know, after you have a meal, like the cell needs energy and they get the nutrients. So that's what I was wondering about. No, no. In general, nutrients are taken in through protein channels. They are very carefully regulated. The okay. entry it is very carefully regulated. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that these were these here were our prokaryotes. 
only the cell membrane. Now we're going to look at these more advanced cells like our own cells. These are more advanced and we call them the eukaryote, E-U-K-A-R-Y-O-T-E, the eukaryote cells. And the ones that we're going to look at are the animal cells and then very briefly at the plant cells. We're more interested, we'll spend more time talking about animal cells. Immediately, just look at them and you realize that these are much, much more complicated than the prokaryote cell. First of all, they have a typical cell structure. They have an outer plasma membrane, the cell membrane around them. On the inside, however, they have many, many, many organelles. Those are areas of the cytoplasm which have their own membranes around them. The membrane performs the same function. It allows the inside of the organelle to be different to the outside. So what it allows is it allows areas of the cytoplasm to become very, very specialized. And they become specialized for a particular purpose. And we'll discuss many of them. You'll hear the, the functions of all of them. But the most prominent one, and the one which often people think of as defining the eukaryote cell, is the nucleus. And here it is here. The nucleus actually has a double membrane around it. It doesn't only have one, but here it is here. And on the inside of the nucleus is most of the cell's DNA. Not all of it, I'll show you where the rest is, but 99% of the cell's DNA, of its hereditary material, is here inside the nucleus, okay? So that's what you usually see in a eukaryote cell. You can usually immediately define it by the fact that it has this prominent nucleus. All of the rest of these organelles here, we will, we will get to discuss, and I'm just gonna mention their names now, not so much their function because we'll talk about it in more detail. Ones that you have probably heard of are the nucleus here and the mitochondria. This is an animal cell. So it has, has these bodies called the mitochondria here. They are the powerhouses of the cell. They produce the, the useful biological energy for the cell to use. The nucleus here contains all the recipes for the proteins for the polypeptides that are going to make up the proteins of the cell. So they are all lodged here in the chromosomes inside the nucleus. But that information is exported to the cell where proteins are made. And all of this material here, you see all of this, these folds here, and then these here. These are all concerned with processing the proteins. Many of these proteins have to be extremely sophisticated. They have to be, they have very, very specialized functions. And they emerge, they initially are produced in a raw form. And it's here in these organelles here that those proteins are refined to their, till they reach their final form. So we'll, we'll see this in more detail in a minute. This is called endoplasmic reticulum. This green body here is called the Golgi body. So you've got mitochondria, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi body, and we'll hear more about them later. We may see all sorts of things on the outside. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Professor, when it comes to the DNA, right? So DNA, uh -huh. I know that uh, it transfers over the information to the RNA, and then the RNA, right. it transfers it over to the ribosomes to give out the proteins, correct? Right. Yeah. Okay, and now with the peroxisome and then the lysosome, those are the cleaners of the cell, if I'm not correct. mistaken? Correct. We'll get okay. to them. Yeah, yeah, we'll get, I, I have them on the list. We'll, we'll, okay, we'll get to them. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, we won't talk much about it, but you can see here, this, is, this thing here is a flagellum. It's to move the cell. Uh, there may be all sorts of other, other things um, on the outside of the cell we'll hear about later. So that is an animal cell. So the two things that tell you it's an animal cell, first of all, it's just got a naked cell membrane around the outside and it only has mitochondria. Just bear that in mind because when we look at a plant cell, we see something a little bit different. The basic form of the cell is the same. It's still got a nucleus, still got the endoplasmic reticulum and everything else we'll see. But look here, 
It does have mitochondria, but the plant cells also have these. They are the chloroplasts, and they are distinctive for plants because the plants photosynthesize, and the chloroplasts are the green bodies where photosynthesis takes place. In addition, Plant cells usually have a cell wall around the outside. Again, rather like we saw in the prokaryotes, here's the cell membrane on the inside. That is a living membrane with, with proteins and everything associated with it. But on the outside of that is a non-living, thick cell wall. And we'll talk about the, fun it has the, much the same function as it does in the prokaryotes, but we'll talk about that function in a minute. So the cell wall here on the inside, the cells, and distinctively for plants, they have chloroplasts as well as mitochondria. Very often plant cells also have a huge big, it looks like a space, but it's not. It's fluid filled organelle called the central vacuole. It's also characteristic of plants. Some animal cells do have vacuoles not filled with water but they may have vacuoles. Um, but the plants have a central vacuole, which is most, it's a solution of water and salts. Its function I'll describe um, in, a, in a minute. Okay, other than that, there's all, there we saw normal cell machinery. It still does the same thing, obeys the central dogma, DNA to RNA, as a student has just said, DNA to RNA, out to the ribosomes, and then all of that raw stuff produced by the ribosomes is processed in the cell to produce the final protein. Okay, now I want to just um, uh, briefly explain to you what the function of, cell, of the cell wall is. The first thing is cell walls in prokaryotes and in the plants are structural. They may give structure to the cell and in the plants they give structure to the plant body. That is their first function, but it's not their most important function. What I want you to picture is this um, membrane here around the outside, the cell membrane, allows water to pass into the cytoplasm very easily. It, there are various reasons why it can, water can go across the membrane, but there are also specialized proteins which are present to allow water to flow very easily into the cell. Well, the inside of the, of the cytoplasm, I told you, is a very rich solution. It's a very concentrated solution of all sorts of things, salts and proteins and all sorts of things. And the, the, so the, the concentration inside the cytoplasm is very high, where the concentration outside in the environment or in the surroundings is probably much, much lower. Well, that's a bit of a problem because in that case, water tries to pass into the cell continuously. Continuously, there's water trying to get in to dilute the in what is What is happening, it's trying to get the concentrations the same on both sides of the membrane. Water floods into the cell. And what is going to happen to the cell? It's going to start expanding. It's going to expand and expand and expand until it actually bursts. And that really does happen. That is a very real danger for cells. If the water continually pours in to try and dilute the interior to such an extent that the cell just swells up and bursts. But look what the cell wall does. The cell wall surrounds the cell entirely. It is the same. It's exactly the same when we look at the prokaryotes. The cell wall entirely surrounds the cell. Here's the, the cell membrane on the inside. The cell swells until it swells up against that cell wall. And it, it exerts a pressure against the cell wall, which we call the turgor, T-U-R-G-O-R, the turgor pressure. And it gets to a point where the pressure pushing up, the cell wall is just as strong and pushes in with the same force. And so then the swelling stops and the cell is protected. So what the, the cell wall is doing when we say that it protects the cell, it protects it 
physically as a barrier, but it protects it from bursting because of this, the flow of water into the cell. That flow into the cell we'll discuss again later, but it has a special term, it's oh. called osmosis. Yeah, go ahead. Um, about the swelling, does that, how does the swelling happen again? Just imagine, I think of an, just think of a, a hypothetical situation, okay? If I have, um, if I have a, a, a jar or something with water in it, and I have a lot of salt in one side, right? And there's lots and lots of salt. What is it, what happens? It tends to diffuse, right? The molecules tend to diffuse through the hole. There's two ways to think about it. First of all, the molecules of salt are diffusing till the concentration is even everywhere. But the other way to think about it is that the water molecules are diffusing to dilute the salt till the concentration is the same everywhere. Do you, do you get that? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. Okay. So now just think about a cell. Okay. We've got it on the inside, the, the membrane allows the inside of the cell to be really, really concentrated. It's got lots of salts and all sorts of things dissolved. And then it's got dilute water on the outside. The water tries to get, tries to get this concentration the same as the outside. In other words, it's trying to dilute this, the inside. The water will pour in across the cell membrane continuously as long as this is more concentrated than the outside. So that is very dangerous because that water pouring in is going to start swelling the cell. But when you have a cell wall like this, then it swells up against the cell wall and it stops. The cell wall is strong enough to keep the cell from swelling anymore. And that's the main importance of, of the cell wall. But in plants, it also allows plants, it gives plants a tremendous amount of strength. In, it gives them, it makes like a skeleton for them. All this pressure and all these cell walls, that's what makes a plant stand upright against the force of gravity. So it's very useful for the plant. Um, animal cells have no cell wall. So what do they do? They've got the same problem. The water tends to pour into the cells if the outside is dilute. Water tends to pour in. But animal cells have pumps, which pump the water out. They pump the water out the whole time uh, to, keep, to make sure that the cell doesn't burst. Professor, they don't have a cell wall to protect them. Yeah, go ahead. So what does the vacuole do? Does it contain water? Yes, it does. Um, this is actually part of the same story because uh, the, the vacuole has salts in it. And the vacuole, the, the water coming into the cell tends to come into the vacuole and swell the vacuole. And the vacuole swells everything out. And that's what gives plants this, their strength, what helps them stand upright. You can see this if you forget to water your plants. They lose all the water, especially they'll lose the water from the vacuole and the plant, the cells will shrink and they lose that pressure against the cell walls and the plant wilts. Give it some water, they fill up the vacuole again, they create the pressure again and the plant will stand upright again. So that is the, that's some, one of the main functions of the central vacuole. Is that okay? Yes, do uh, animal, uh, animal cells have vacuoles or no? They have vacuoles, but not for the same purpose. Vacuoles in, in animals are usually just for storage, like they store fat. They're much sort of smaller, thing. right? Because I mean- animals... Usually much smaller. Well, it depends on the cell you're talking about. But um, yeah, they, they are not as common. Almost all plant cells have a vacuole, but uh, animal cells only have a vacuole if they specialize cells. So it's not that common in animal cells. Plant cells need the vacuole because they can't just get up and get water. They have to exactly. Water. It's yes, and not only that. Especially land plants have got to resist the force of gravity the whole time, um, especially when they're young. As they get older, they get more strength. But especially when when they're young, they have to resist the force of gravity. So they need kind of an internal skeleton, if you if you can picture it that way, and that's 
the function of the cell walls and then this pressure inside the cell that, that gets, makes them rigid um, against the cell wall. Okay, let's have a look um, at function of some specific things. Let's look first of all at the nucleus. Um, again, in most cells, in most eukaryote cells, that's what these are. In the eukaryote cells, plant or animal, whatever you're talking about, the nucleus is usually the most prominent organelle. And here it is here. It actually has a double membrane. There's a membrane on the inside here, and there's, there's a membrane on the outside here, which is actually part of this organelle, which we talk about in a minute, the endoplasmic reticulum. On the inside here um, are, is all of the DNA, um, but it's DNA in the form of chromosomes, long lengths of DNA molecule, but we can't actually see them for the most of the life of the cell, that the DNA is, is unwound and forms a very fine network called chromatin, which is just visible as this kind of granular stuff inside the nucleus. As the cell approaches the time when it needs to divide, the chromosomes will begin to condense. They begin to get wound up thick and they start to become visible inside the nucleus. But for most of the life of the cell, we can't actually see the chromosomes. They are unwound. That is because they are busy doing their job. They're unwound so that the genes can be accessed really easily. As time comes for cells to divide, a lot of the genes stop working and the chromosomes get wound down until we can actually see them. We'll see it in a minute as well. So this around the outside is called the nuclear envelope and it's a double membrane. Um, but stuff has to still get inside the, the nucleus and get out. For example, we said DNA is transcribed to messenger RNA. Messenger RNA actually has to leave the nucleus and it leaves through these. These are, are nuclear pores. They have a very complex structure to regulate passage of things back and forth. There are various proteins and things enzymes, all sorts of things which need to get into the nucleus. So they are also coming through these pores here. Um, there is one area of the nucleus which is often quite prominent and it's this area here often stains very dark. It's a specialized area of the DNA which makes special kinds of RNA. It doesn't make messenger RNA. The RNA has many functions in the cell. And um, there are, for example, the ribosomes are made up largely of RNA. And that RNA is made here. And this we call the nucleolus. Um, it's often very easily seen on the nucleus. The DNA here inside the nucleus, the chromosomes are act very, very precisely wound. They are very precisely structured and they're structured around proteins, which are called the histones. So these, the histone proteins, you can think of them as being packaging proteins. Normally, these chromosomes are spun are loose and unwound, only partially wound, as, as you can see here. They are still wound around histones, but as we get to cell division, these histones begin to get associated closer and closer and closer with one another to thicken those chromosomes. Um, is there anything else I need to tell you at the moment about it? Nuclear pause? No, I don't think so. Okay, so we've talked, uh, we've mentioned that DNA is transcribed to messenger RNA and messenger RNA is then translated by the ribosomes. The ribosomes are small little bodies not organelles, they don't have a membrane around them. They're small bodies inside the cytoplasm. They're, we see them in two prominent places. First of all, they may be loose inside the cytoplasm um, where they're perfectly functional, but very often they are actually stuck to the outside of this organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. 
and the, I'll explain why that is in, in a second. They may also be, be stuck on, onto the nuclear envelope, which is the outer, that outer sheath of the nuclear envelope is actually part of the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so let's just have a look at the, the structure of the ribosomes. They actually have two parts to them. They have a large subunit here, and then a small subunit here. And the, um, normally inside the cytoplasm, those two units are separate. But as soon as you put messenger RNA anywhere near them, they will clamp onto the messenger RNA, and they'll start the process of translation. It is possible, it depends on what they are producing. It is possible that they can produce protein free inside the cytoplasm. But very, very often, um, the protein requires that they be associated with this organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. Here, as I showed you before, the endoplasmic reticulum can often almost fill the cell. And it's these interleaved envelopes one over the other, one over the other, one over the other. Very, very extensive, very complex. As I say, often almost filling the cell. And in the, in the just picture here, um, there you see one dark line, that's the, out, the membrane of the endoplasm. There's the other membrane there. So this would be like an envelope, like that, with an interior. And that interior we call the lumen. L-U-M-E-N, so that is the lumen. This, all of this endoplasmic reticulum has many, many, many ribosomes associated with it. They stick to the outside. You can see them there. They're all stuck to the outside. What they're doing is they're actually translating messenger RNA and they are pumping protein, the polypeptide rather, into the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum is like a factory and it's, it takes the raw material, the polypeptide that the ribosome produces, it takes it and it begins to refine it. It begins to change it and it can perform very, very sophisticated actions on that polypeptide. So we can have free ribosomes in the cytoplasm, but very often the ribosomes are in fact associated with endoplasmic reticulum. And when we have endoplasmic reticulum with all of these ribosomes, we call it rough endoplasmic reticulum for obvious reasons. It looks like, it looks rough, it looks like sandpaper or something. So large subunit, small subunit. And um, I've just mentioned this a minute ago, the ribosomes are actually made of two things. They're made of RNA, their own RNA. It's called ribosomal RNA, and there are several of them. And also some proteins that make up the large unit and then the small subunit. Much later on, we'll, we'll see a little bit more about how ribosomes function to actually do the process of translation. Okay, so I've already mentioned the endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum forms a part of a very, very extensive system of membranes and um, lumens and all sorts of things which go throughout the cell, which we call the endomembrane system. And the endomembrane system has these parts. It has the nuclear envelope, as I already showed you. The outer uh, layer actually forms part of the endoplasmic reticulum. Then the endoplasmic reticulum itself. Then this body called the Golgi apparatus. Then somebody has already mentioned these organelles here, the lysosomes, which are produced by the Golgi apparatus largely, produced by the Golgi apparatus, the lysosomes. And then vacuoles. We've seen the, the big central vacuole in the plant, but we do have some vacuoles in animal cells as well usually for storage, it's still part of the endomembrane system because they arise from the Golgi. And then the plasma membrane around the organelles and around the outside, those all have to be produced somewhere. 
and they are produced by the endomembrane system. And they communicate, the, all of these parts communicate with one another. Sometimes they're joined, like the nuclear membrane is joined to the endoplasmic reticulum. But other times they're not actually physically joined, but they still have to communicate with one another. They have to send product, for example, from one to the other to be processed further. And that they do that by sending vesicles. These are small spherical membrane bound units containing a substance, which is then directed somewhere. We'll see exactly how this works in a minute. Okay, here's the endoplasmic reticulum. You can see that it's actually the outer, especially the outer membrane of the, you can see there how it's joined there. Um, the outer membrane of the nuclear envelope forms the, this part, inner part of the endoplasmic reticulum, and then it forms these extensive folds and envelopes, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. The rough endoplasmic reticulum is characterized by having ribosomes stuck on it. And they are pumping, as I told you, they are pumping polypeptide into the lumen here, into the, that cavity on the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum. Now the endoplasmic reticulum is a factory. It's going to refine the polypeptide that the ribosome produces until it reaches a point where either the endoplasmic reticulum can no longer finish the job or else the endoplasmic reticulum produces a final product. Um, if, the if it produces a final product, that is fine. It's uh, released in, usually in the, in the form of a vesicle to go off to its destination. So I'll give you an example. Um, the endoplasmic reticulum, for example, may make um, cell membrane. Well, cell membrane, you'll remember it consisted of phospholipid with proteins embedded in it. That can all be done by the endoplasmic reticulum. It will produce a little vesicle with the appropriate proteins in it, and then send that vesicle off to the edge of this, to the boundary of the cell where it can unite with the existing cell membrane. Maybe the cell is growing and it needs to expand its cell membrane. Manufactured in the, in the, manufactured here, sent off as a vesicle to the cell membrane where it unites and it allows the cell membrane to expand. But sometimes the cell, the uh, protein needs to be so extensively modified that it cannot be completed by the endoplasmic reticulum. And then the endoplasmic reticulum will send it off for final, uh, for final processing somewhere else. We'll see in a second. That's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. There is another kind of endoplasmic reticulum. Here's the rough endoplasmic reticulum here. Easy to recognize because it has the lumen. Here are the membranes. The dark line is the membrane on the outside and these black dots or the ribosome stuck to it. That is rough endoplasmic reticulum there. So that is rough endoplasmic, often very, very extensive. But there's another kind of endoplasmic reticulum called the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it's here. In, this is an electron micrograph, and you can see it's been cut across here. And it's like tubes and pipes. That's what it looks like, all united. But now no longer these envelopes like the rough endoplasmic reticulum, instead these tubes and pipes. And the endoplasmic, smooth endoplasmic reticulum has several um, uh, functions. The one function which is really important is it's a, a site of detoxification. Many toxins are detoxified in here in the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, so for example, um, the liver is full of smooth endoplasmic reticulum because that's the main site in our body of detoxification. In heavy drinkers, for example, the endoplasmic reticulum eventually becomes damaged from being exposed to alcohol continuously. And that is why heavy drinkers end up suffering from liver disease 
the smooth endoplasmic reticulum detoxification process no longer works. The other thing that the smooth endoplasmic reticulum does, it makes phospholipids. And this is the site of much of the phospholipids, the basic skeleton of the of membrane is made here, and it's then sent for refinement to the endoplasmic reticulum. And the last thing is that there are some specialized areas of in where the endoplasmic reticulum is a calcium store. And the most prominent of these is in muscle. In muscle, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is specially constructed to contain calcium. Calcium is the switch which causes muscles to contract. So that is why it's stored in the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, and I think, okay, the one thing we need to just uh, be sure you understand, these um, membranes here are very, very mobile. And um, they can, they move, and they can pinch off uh, bits of themselves. And that is how they form these vesicles. And you'll realize this is the lumen of the endoplasmic reticulum. And if I pinch off a vesicle, what I'm doing is I'm pinching off some of the contents of the lumen and I can send that off. I can send it off to its final destination or I can send it off to somewhere where the contents need to be need to be processed more. They are, the vesicles are the way in which components of the endo of the endomembrane system communicate with one another. So this is the um, I just want to uh, Where's my picture? I haven't got a picture of the Golgi. That's not possible. Um, just give me one second, would you? No. Oh, sorry. I don't know why I hid that. Okay. Now, where am I? Okay, sorry for that. I hid that when I wasn't supposed to have hidden it. Um, so here's the Golgi apparatus. This is the most incredible thing. This is the most amazing part of, of the cells. This little body consists of these um, envelopes all lying next to one another, kind of nestled into one another. They don't actually join to one another. They communicate with one another, as I'll describe in a minute. But let's just think, for example, the endoplasmic reticulum has taken a polypeptide and it's processed it as far as it possibly can. But that need that polypeptide needs to be extensively processed further in order to be functional. And it's sent to the Golgi. It's sent in the form of, of these vesicles. The vesicles come to the Golgi, and here you can see one uniting with the Golgi there. That's called the receiving face. And it, here it's receiving vesicle. Within these here, they are called the cisterni. And within the cisterni, further processing of that uh, polypeptide protein will take place. And it re reaches uh, absolutely extraordinary levels of refinement. Some of these proteins are highly, highly, highly specialized and they, they are processed by the Golgi. The Golgi at this cisterna may process it and then if it needs further processing, it can make bud or vesicles which will go up to the other cisterna. So it processes a little bit here, sends it up for more processing, more processing, more pro until the final product is, it may be fine, it may be released early on in the Golgi if it doesn't need further processing, but here it, um, here it, we, we, we see that, uh, that it does. So um, I just need to make sure that I have you. Fine. Okay, so, um, the, we need to think about what sorts of things the Golgi is producing. It, it's true, it produces all sorts of functional proteins like things which 
uh, which are sensory and all sorts of things. But one of the important areas that the Golgi is involved in is in digestion, because the, the digestive enzymes are highly specialized and they need to be very, very carefully treated. You can't just have digestive enzymes floating free inside the, the, the cytoplasm or inside the cell. Because what does a digestive enzyme do but digest things, right? And for example, the, the Golgi produces many enzymes which break down proteins. Well, if you have those running loose inside the cell, you're going to cause a lot of damage. So instead, they become packaged. And they are packaged into an organelle called the lysosome. And um, the lysosome, very, not always, but very often the lysosome contains digestive enzymes, um, which are degradative. So um, they, there's two things about them. First of all, remember what I told you. The whole purpose of the membrane was to allow the inside of the organelle to be different to the outside. Here's one instance where this is really true. Because most lysosomal enzymes work at a very low pH. That is, they work in an acid environment. The outside, the cytoplasm, is pretty much neutral. But the inside of the lysosome is very acid. And the, um, as a result, um, the, the lysosome is like a reservoir, a safe reservoir of these enzymes. But we need to see how is it then that they reach their target? Because they, they need to, they're obviously there for a purpose. They've got to digest something. How do they reach their target? Well, here's a typical way. This is especially true, by the way, for animal cells. Um, animal cells uh, very often can take in material from the outside. They can, here's the cell membrane here. And this is the outside. Let's just say this is a food item. Okay. The animal cell membrane can bud off towards the inside. Here's the cytoplasm. And it buds off and brings in the food item. And it forms what is called a food vacuole. It's membrane bound because it came from the cell membrane there. It's not an organelle really, um, but it's a food vacuole. Um, and the food vacuole actually, is, it's not really an organelle, it's very temporary. The food vacuole now unites with the lysosome. Here's the lysosome here safely containing its digestive enzymes. The food vacuole unites with the lysosome. The lysosome and the food vacuole contents become mixed and the food vacuole and the, and the, it, the digestion is taking place inside that food vacuole by the contents of the lysosome. There are ways then of neutralizing the contents and stopping uh, the, the um, enzymatic activity so that the, the food, the breakdown products of the food can then be used. Okay, so uh, the, the food vacuole, this is the lysosome here. Um, and there are one or two other instances where, where lysosomes uh, are, are useful as well. One of them is this. Most of the organelles have a certain lifespan and uh, they, they, uh, in the end they die mitochondria, chloroplasts, all sorts of things like that. They all have a, a limited lifespan. And um, instead of simply wasting the materials that made up those organelles, they are very often recycled. And they are recycled by uniting them, uniting the organelle, dying organelle, with a lysosome. And the lysosome actually digests them and reduces them to useful byproducts for the, for the cell to then use. So that's, that's, a, that's what's happening here. Um, in this case as well, there is another little organelle called a peroxisome, which is involved. Um, and uh, peroxisomes are particularly important whenever we have to deal with the mitochondria. Mitochondria, for all sorts of complicated reasons, produce some very uh, nasty oxygen byproducts and things and uh, peroxisomes are concerned with neutralizing those. So peroxisome and lysosome together are used 
to uh, break down the mitochondrion without any damage to the cell. And this is called autophagy. Autophagy means self-feeding. So this is how uh, mitochondria, chloroplasts, all sorts of things like that can in fact be recycled by the cell. Okay, so I've mentioned vacuoles a couple of times. Vacuole you can think of actually as being a very large vesicle because it has something of the same structure. It has a single membrane around the outside. Very often they arise as spheres, just like vesicles, but then they, they, they are very much larger. And um, there are different functions de depending on what cell you... We've talked about the central vacuole um, in, in plants, um, and that it's, it is a store of salts and things, but its main function is to provide that turgor pressure for the cells. Food vacuoles, we've talked about. That those were these vacuoles formed when a cell pinches off material from the outside and brings it in to the, to the cytoplasm. There are many kinds of storage vacuoles. In animal cells, the most important one are fat cells. They're also called adipose cells. And fat cells contain very large vacuoles, which are full of lipid. And that's a fuel storage. That's our fat tissue. In plants, um, you may see uh, vacuoles, which also contain starch that, that does occur. Um, and um, the, in plants, you may also see some which have lipids in as well. The, there's one kind of vacuole, which I should mention, which is uh, very, very specialized. And that is a very, very active vacuole called a contractile vacuole which occurs in uh, mostly in freshwater organisms and especially in single cell organisms. They face that exact same problem that we've talked about before. Water floods into the cell and it tends to swell them. And if they don't do anything about it, they will burst. They, those organisms use this system. It is called a contractile vacuole. It, it is a pump. It pulls water out of the cytoplasm and it pumps it to the outside, pulls water in, pumps it out, pump, pumps it out continuously. And um, so th remember these food vacuole, storage vacuoles, contractile vacuole, and sent the central vacuole. Be sure you understand the differences between them. Yes, some pictures. Yes, go ahead. I don't think you ever showed us the notes for the Golgi apparatus. I don't no, I no, no, I've he I have hidden some of the notes. I've hidden some of the notes. Uh, so I go, just go straight to the picture. Okay. You've got, you've got them, right? Have I left anything out? There was a whole slide about the Golgi apparatus and I uh, didn't get it. Uh, we didn't go through it. Oh, okay. That's all right. Let me go back. Where am I? No, sorry. Hold on one second. Uh, here, the Golgi, this. Uh, this is it. Yes. Um, I think I did cover, I can do it again. That's fine. That, that's no problem. I might have left something out. Um, okay, so we, we know the, the basic structure, right? It consists of these flattened envelopes, sacs, which are called the cisterni, which uh, fit one on over the other here. Um, and the, 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 the interior of each one is a processing uh, center, like, like a, a separate factory, which is going to modify the proteins. So they, the Golgi will move stuff from one cisterna to the next as needed, by means of vesicles which bud, bud off. The thing that maybe I did not ex uh, explain um, was this. One of the things that we need to understand, um, when I say that uh, something like the endoplasmic reticulum sends a vesicle to the Golgi, well, that's a huge and very complicated thing. How does the vesicle know that it's got to go to the Golgi? And how does it know how to get there? Well, we're going to learn 
that first of all, the cell actually labels the vesicles. It labels them. It gives them an address, a cellular address, and the cell responds to that address. It, what it will do is the cell will actually build a, literally a track, a little protein track all the way from the origin to the destination. If you want to go from endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi, the cell will build a protein track and the vesicle will be moved along that track to the Golgi. We'll see it in a little bit later um, how exactly how that is done. So those are referred to as transport vesicles. Transport vesicles are things which are manufactured, which move from one part of the endomembrane system to another. Um, is there anything else that you're unclear about on the Golgi? No, I got it. Thank you so much. That's fine. Where am I? We did that. We did that. Okay, some pictures. This is a, this. Is, if I showed you this, um, uh, you would immediately be able to tell me this was a plant cell in section, and you'd know that because of this here, the central vacuole, and these here, the chloroplasts. We're going to learn about this structure in a minute. That immediately. This here is the nucleus there. These are chloroplasts. That there, that there, and that there, and here's the central vacuole of the plant cell. Uh, this is just a summary diagram, just to remind you, um, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, buds or vesicles, which can go to the, the, the Golgi, where they're processed, the Golgi itself moves stuff through the different layers, and buds it often send it off as needed. Um, remember that the smooth ER has no ribosomes associated with it, but this is basically a summary of the endomembrane system for you. Okay, let's talk about um, uh, the, these two really important organelles, the mitochondria and the chloroplasts. Mitochondria and chloroplasts um, differ very much from one another, but they are both concerned with energy transformation. And the, f the first one that we'll talk about, because it occurs in both, in all you, most eukaryote cells, it occurs in both animal cells and plant cells. These are the mitochondria. These are the sites of a particular process called cellular respiration. Now, cellular respiration is not breathing in and out. <gasps> Cellular respiration is actually the production of energy from fuel. And it's energy in a particular form. It's biologically useful energy, and that is this substance called ATP. So the ATP, most ATP is manufactured in mitochondria. And the mitochondria are the, called the powerhouses of the cell because they are the ones who produce ATP most efficiently and they produce a lot of it. Yep. Edward, do you need me? Okay. I'm sorry, I might have pressed something. I was copying. No, that's all right. Sorry. No, that's all right. No, that's fine. Um, the, uh, so the mitochondria, the sites of cellular respiration, which is the process which is going to produce masses of ATP for the cell to use. They occur in both plants and in animals. The chloroplasts are only found in plants and in algae, and they are the sites of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is also an energy transformation system because it's taking light energy from the sun and it's transforming that light energy into chemical energy, into a chemical energy form, which the cell can then use. Uh, we're not going to talk about, over much about the function yet because we will talk about this later on when we talk about metabolism. But we'll have, let's have a look at the structure of the two. And you'll see that there are some similarities. There's some big differences as well, but there are some similarities. First of all, here's the mitochondrion. The mitochondria can be very, very common in a cell. They are much more common in cells which need a lot of energy. That's fairly obvious, like muscle cells have a lot of mitochondria. Any very active cell uh, contains a lot of mitochondria. But here they have um, an outer membrane. They have a double membrane structure. They have an outer membrane there, and here on the inside, 
You have an inner membrane, and this inner membrane is intricately folded. Here's an electron micrograph, a slice through the mitochondria. You can just see the outer membrane, and then here's the inner membrane. Here are the folds. Here, the reason that the the reason that they, these folds occur is all of the energy production takes place on these, this membrane. It takes place on this inner membrane. So the mitochondria needs a lot of surface area to maximize the amount of ATP that it can produce. Um, the interior of the mitochondria is called the matrix, and it's the equivalent of the cytoplasm. So we've got an outer membrane and an inner membrane, then this jelly-like interior here. Um, there are certain metabolic processes that do take place inside that matrix, but I want to tell you something really interesting about the mitochondria. And that is, if we look carefully at the mitochondria, we'll find that it actually has a chromosome. It has its own chromosome, and the chromosome is in the form of a circle. And there's a, Something else we've talked about that has a circular chromosome, and those are the prokaryotes, the bacteria. They have a circular chromosome as well. In addition, the mitochondrion has its own ribosomes, and it manufactures some of its own proteins, not all of them. There are some proteins it requires the cell to produce, but it produces some of its own proteins. It has its own ribosomes, has its own chromosome, what does it sound like? It sounds very much as if the mitochondrion is like a prokaryote, which it is. If we look at the, mit at the ribosomes, their, their structure is very like prokaryote ribosomes, which are slightly different to eukaryote ribosomes. And we believe that in fact the mitochondrion, way back in the evolutionary time, was once a free living prokaryotes, which became incorporated into a primitive eukaryote cell. And it became incorporated, very, and it's very useful, because the mitochondrion has a perfectly safe environment, given everything it needs to make ATP, and the host cell derives all of the ATP. Now they have become completely dependent. You can't take mitochondria out of a cell and have them survive happily. You can keep them for a while but they're not forever. Also, mitochondria divide by binary fission, just like prokaryotes. They grow, and then they divide, and they separate. And they do many of the things that bacteria do. They form chains, networks, all sorts of things which prokaryotes do. So they, often they behave like prokaryotes. And we believe that they, that is actually their origin, is, it was as a prokaryote. Um, so I think that that's all I need to tell you about the mitochondria. Let's move to the chloroplast. The chloroplasts have some similarities to the mitochondria. We believe that they were also once independent organisms, independent prokaryotes. The system of photosynthesis developed in the prokaryotes. It developed in a particular branch of the bacteria called the cyanobacteria and chloroplasts are very closely related to the cyanobacteria. They also have a double membrane, like the mitochondria. Uh, they have an inner membrane. Here, the inner membrane is folded very, very, very intricately. It's very difficult to, to work out that it's actually part of, originated from the inner membrane. But it's folded into all of these stacked envelopes here. And um, these, uh, each of these stacks, here is called a granum, and the individual envelope is called a thylakoid. They are green because that's where chlorophyll is embedded. Chlorophyll is embedded into the membranes of the thylakoids, and it's here that photosynthesis takes place. Apart from that, the chloroplasts also have their own, their own chromosome. They have their own DNA, their own ribosome. They just, they are in much the same way as the mitochondria, we believe that they were once independent living organisms which were taken in and became part of the eukaryote cell. That is a system which we call endosymbiosis. And um, we believe it was the origin of several 
of the of the organelles of the eukaryotes. Okay, I'm going to just stop there for the moment, um, and um, let's just see if any of you have questions, either about this material or about anything previous. Uh, we've got we've got five or ten minutes that we could we can devote to questions if you have any. Are we having a quiz this Wednesday? You are having a quiz this Wednesday, just a short quiz. Um, I, I think just five or six questions. And it will be uh, like, when, like the 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 processes that are carried out carried out in a cell and the different like cell structures. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yes. Up till the up till today, up till the end of today. So, um, you, and, and and just very a very brief quiz. Okay. Um, it'll be it'll be up at the normal at the class time uh, for you to answer. You go just go to quizzes on Canvas. Also, this video, like this recorded video, it will be posted on Wednesday. Uh, I'll post. I'll post this. I'll post this tomorrow. Probably tomorrow morning. It'll be finished processing. And then Wednesdays will be a brand new video, right? The no. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. 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 It's going to be a new video. Yeah. So the test is just based off of today. Well, the um, what did we do last, the, the, the last uh, class? I can't remember. Um, we finished off last time talking about DNA and proteins, right? Um, yes, and RNA. Oh, um, I don't want it to get too, too complicated. Let's just make it for today's. Let's just, let's just stick, we'll do a quiz just on today's. On, on about the, the uh, organelles, the cells and organelles. Okay, um, I'll 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 do a, a quiz about the, um, the end of biomolecules uh, at another time. Just for the, just stick with what what we did today, and it'll only be short. It's not it's not for very much. I have another question. Uh huh. Go ahead. Sorry, they've just built up in the past few weeks. You know. Yes, I'm sure. So the assignment on my lab and mastering, I completed both of the assignments, the introductory one, and then on the chapters so far that we've we've covered. Yes. Uh, you know how like when you get some of them wrong, like if you make a mistake the first time, you lose partial credit. The overall final score that you get on all of the questions combined, that's your grade, right? Yes, it's and and you can redo them without do them without submitting. You can do them over and over again without submitting and and then just submit when you're happy with your answers okay i see yeah you don't you um i don't mind i mean that's the whole point of the assignment some of them are way out some of them are stuff that's not even talked about you know um like it'll say a reading qu question where you've actually got to go and kind of look things up but that's the whole idea is that it's it, you can repeat them and, and learn as you're looking stuff up and everything else. The, the assignments are very definitely not a, not a test or a quiz. Uh, they're there for you to work through as you see fit. And um, however you arrive at the final answer, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that you do the learning process as you get to the final answer. Anyone else? Where are we? It's 20 past. All right, everyone. Um, I tell you what, um, please, uh, these, these will obvious, this will obviously be posted for you. As usual, um, you'll get an email with, um, with the MP4, and then I'll post to the YouTube channel as well. Um, again, your quiz on Wednesday is just very, very short, and it'll just be on today's, today's class. Um, and then um, we'll have a new, we'll move on uh, to on Wednesday with a new lecture. And uh, the, on Wednesday, it's an asynchronous class. I'm going to record the, the video and put it up for you. It won't be a live class. But don't forget, Thursday, if you have any questions, um, I'll send you the link to meet me um, at 12 o'clock on Thursday.
to, and I'll try and answer your questions. I hope that this works for you. If you have suggestions for how to make it work better, I'm more than happy, more than happy to, to entertain those ideas, all right? Everybody okay? Yes, thank you, Professor. Have a beautiful day. You too, you too. It's not, I, I'm sorry I can't like really meet you. <laughs> um, I can just see some of you, I can see some of you, those of you who put your pictures up. Um, I can see you uh, if I look through, but um, at least I feel like you could, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you in real time. So, okay then everybody, um, I'll, I'll see you again next Monday or on Thursday, uh, but don't forget there'll be a class up on Wednesday for you. Okay. Also, okay, bye -bye. You, can al yeah, you can always send me questions on email, all right? If, if, that is, if you want to do that. Thank you for doing the live class. It was very helpful. Okay, I'm glad. All right.